Well, today we're going to have the privilege of listening to James again. But before we do, we're going to have not a sing time, we're going to have a special music time. And uh, I don't know if you've seen any of the, of the CDs over there of the special music. And your name again is... Laura. Boy, it's a good thing I got that right. So her name is Laura, and if you missed your special music the other night, you missed a real treat. So we're going to give you two songs now, and uh, then before we begin, I hope that you'll be blessed with her music. And I'm going to turn the time over to her. because it really shows that, you know, so often, like, we pray for the things we want, yes. and we can become frustrated if, if God isn't answering when we think he should or how we think he should, but God's plans are so far beyond ours. Amen. And he knows what we need more than we do, and sometimes, sometimes those answers come in ways we couldn't imagine, and sometimes even through trials. Thank you. 
All right, well, for the last song, um, let's keep going on the theme of prayer. And I'm going to share with you a song that actually a good friend of mine wrote and my mom wrote the music to. And this was a song that she wrote for her sister. It's a prayer for her sister. And I heard it and I, was, and I loved the song. So I took it and I kind of changed it a little bit to make it um, more relatable for everyone. And I think that praying for our loved ones is something that we can all relate to, right? Amen. We all have somebody or multiple friends and family that we pray for that we just long for them to know God. And I know that I did. I prayed for my brother for probably 10 years. And I had many discouraging times when I just felt like that my prayers weren't being heard and I just I wasn't sure if God was hearing. And it took 10 years of consistent praying. I prayed every single day at the same time. I set aside the time every day. And I got to see that prayer answered right in front of my eyes. I saw the whole transition of him giving his life to God. And it was it was so amazing and so exciting. And I want to encourage you, if you have people, loved ones that you're praying for, I know sometimes it can seem really discouraging, but don't ever give up on them because we can know for sure that God is working. stuff. Good stuff. Never heard that one before because it's yours. Beautiful. Absolutely beautiful. Well, today we're happy to once again uh, remind you of the little red box. Just a touch of history. Do you like touches of history? The uh, first camp meeting that was held here, there was no way they could have pulled that off until some people right down the road who are not Seventh-day Adventist Christians, who are not attenders at the Seventh-day Adventist Church, who heard that the Adventists wanted to hold a camp meeting, wrote out a check for $5,000. And if they can do that, we can certainly dig deep to make sure that these continue, amen? amen. So don't forget the little red box. 
Let's pray together. Father in heaven, what a privilege it is to be here together again and hear your word spoken. We, we lift up James to you. We ask that you would anoint his lips, his heart, with your very presence. May we hear words that will draw us closer to you. Let your name be glorified in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you, James. church. It's good to be here. We are continuing our study on the ultimate sacrifice. We've been looking at the ultimate sacrifice that was made by the Father. That's how we started in the story of Abraham and Isaac. And then we moved to the ultimate sacrifice that was made by Christ. And we kind of left off there. We got in a little deep, talking about some of the aspects of God's love for us. Isaiah chapter 53. And you remember we talked about this uh, chapter being present truth, part of the loud cry of Revelation chapter 18, because this chapter is all about the report. And the report is the gospel, the everlasting gospel, the good news. And this report focuses on Jesus. And it focuses on everything he's done for us, everything he's experienced for us talked about that relationship to the idea that Christ did not merely die a physical death. That the cross from the physical aspect was probably hardly felt by Christ because of the emotional trauma he was going through. And we related that, or began to relate that to us and to what we experience in life in a fallen world. Uh, not just out there, you know, with people that we don't know, but especially with people that we do know. Because the people that are closest to us are the ones that hurt us the most. They have that potential to hurt us the most. And we talked about a little bit about how we build walls and barriers and we pull away from people primarily so we won't be hurt. Or because we have been hurt. And we talked about, or began to talk about how Christ didn't do that. Actually, he brought or drew closer to people, uh, and he experienced the full uh, pain of rejection and hurt. And his heart was filled with anguish because this world received him not. And so we left off at Isaiah chapter 53. If you want to open up there again, we're going to pick up there. But we're also going to transition in this uh, meeting. It's 3.09 right now, and this meeting goes from 3 to 4. But uh, Annika told me that I can go ahead and preach until supper time. That's fun. Which is about, what, 5 o'clock? So we're good to go. No, we'll, we'll, but we're going to transition from Christ into the Holy Spirit, the ultimate sacrifice of the Holy Spirit, will stay on the same line, the same basic understanding when we talk about the Holy Spirit, and then we're going to move tomorrow. I thought I had two meetings tomorrow, two meetings today, one tomorrow evening, we'll talk about uh, the sacrifice of praise, our response to all that God has done for us, and how that response comes forth, you know, because it's not something we can do, it's something that God does in us, and it's a miracle, what God does in us is a miracle. You know, I was, I was listening to the words of both of these last songs. Uh, my heart was touched by the words that were speaking of a God and the way that he relates to us and the way that he relates to people we pray for. And that's the Holy Spirit. That's what the Holy Spirit does. The Holy Spirit works on our hearts. If we open the door to the Holy Spirit. So it's not something we do. It's something that God does. And we're here making ourselves available and opening our hearts uh, to the work of the Holy Spirit. That's pretty good. Father in heaven, we want to thank you again this afternoon on this warm afternoon that we can be warmed by your spirit, warmed by the message of the gospel. We want to give you this time and give you our hearts. That's why we're here. We're here because we are ready to give up on ourselves. We failed again and again and again, and we're ready to let you work in our lives and touch us and speak to us through your word, through the experience, the ultimate sacrifice of Jesus, the ultimate sacrifice of the spirit. So, Father, I lift up each person here, uh, those that are troubled, distracted, those of us who are overwhelmed, those of us who feel blessed and comfortable uh, from whatever walks of life we're from, whatever we're experiencing in life right now, 
wherever our minds and hearts are at, Father, I just lift this up and pray that you'll speak to us through your word. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 All right, Isaiah chapter 53, and I just wanted us to pick up where we left off. We talked about the emotional experience that Christ went through in Isaiah chapter 53, and we left off in verse 3. So we're in verse 4. Surely he hath borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. What kind of pain is that? Is that physical pain or emotional pain? That's emotional pain. Our griefs, our sorrows. We did esteem him smitten of God, stricken, smitten of God and afflicted. And that's, that's a reality that took place when Christ was on this earth, specifically when he was on the cross. When Christ was on the cross, the Jews looked at him and they assessed him as him suffering the wrath of God. God is the one that's doing this to him. And the reason why God is doing this to him is because he claimed to be the Son of God. He claimed to be the Messiah. And so God's wrath is upon him. So this prophecy in Isaiah 53 verse 4 was fulfilled in the reaction that the religious leaders had when Christ was hanging upon the cross. But he was not going to this affliction because of something he had done, because he claimed to be the Messiah, because of an attitude that he had assumed he was going through this affliction, not for him, but for us. Not for his sins, but for our sins. Not for his waywardness, but for our waywardness. He was doing this for us. And that's why it says in verse 5 that he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him. And with his stripes, we are what? Healed. Healed. And that's what we want. We want to be healed. Not just outwardly healed, but an inner healing, a sozo, if you will. A complete healing of heart, mind, soul, and spirit. The whole person healed. All we like sheep have gone astray, verse 6 says. We've, got, we've turned everyone to his own way. And the Lord God has laid upon him the iniquity of us all. No one's been left out of that. There's no one that isn't included in the sacrifice that God has made, that Christ has made for our sins. Every single person on planet Earth is included in this. All have been predestined to have a place in heaven, if they will. He was oppressed, verse 7. He was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. He's brought as a lamb to the slaughter, as a sheep before her shearers is done, so he opened not his mouth. He was taken from prison and from judgment. And who shall declare his generation? For he was cut off out of the land of the living, for the transgression of my people was he stricken. And he made his grave with the wicked and with the rich in his death, because he had done no violence, neither was any deceit found in his mouth. Now, verse 10 is where we see a transition take place between God, the Father, and the Son in relationship to what we've been talking about in the ultimate sacrifice. Verse 10 says that it pleased the Lord to bruise him, the Son. What? You know, as a father, I can't relate to that. The bruising we're talking about here is the fact of what Christ went through for us, how he suffered for us, that pleased the Lord. Why would that please the Lord? It pleased the Lord to bruise him. He had put him to grief. When thou shalt make his soul an offering for sin, he shall see his seed, he shall prolong his days, the pleasure of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. Verse 11, he will see the travail of his soul and shall be satisfied. That's why it pleased him. God was pleased because God was looking at us. Hebrews chapter 12 says that he despised the shame when he looked at us. So that's nothing. That shame is nothing. I'm not, even, I'm not even worried about that shame because I'm looking at people. I'm looking at men, women, children who are going to be saved, eternally saved in my kingdom. And so this is why it pleased the Lord. It didn't please the Lord because it was pleasing for him to see his son suffering. Not at all. That was so painful, so heartrending for God. That he could hardly look. Christ was enshrouded in darkness on the cross. All nature veiled its face, if you will. That's not what pleased the Lord. What pleased the Lord was that this sacrifice that they were making together, it wasn't a sacrifice that the Son was making apart from the Father. You know that. You've got to understand that. But they were making it together, that it would prove a blessing to us. That our lives would be changed. That we would actually take a different course, a different direction in this sin-fallen world. 
that we would be here today instead of out there somewhere <coughs> doing drugs or living for ourselves and for selfish pleasure, hurting and being hurt, that we would be in an atmosphere of grace and taking in that atmosphere, we would allow that atmosphere to go out from us to others. This is why God was pleased. Because he saw you, he saw me, he saw our testimonies, he saw our stories. He saw the way our lives were changed. He saw a different direction. He saw the impact of that direction on other people. He saw that people would be in the kingdom of God because you chose to take a different direction. He saw people in the kingdom of God that you didn't even know were impacted by your influence. It's interesting, isn't it, that we talk about this family down the road or this, these people down the road, uh, Pastor Bird was saying, who donated $5,000. Why did they do that? What was the reason behind that? They don't come, they don't attend, they're not here. But somehow, they were impressed with the idea that this is a good thing. This is something to invest in. This is something that can have an impact, a positive impact, on people, on the community. It's had a powerful impact on me. I mean, when I came out to the middle of nowhere the other day, right? <laughs> it's like, there's a church out here. There's a camp meeting out here. I mean, there's not even a town out here. There's not even a grocery store out here. And Adventists are here. And they're pitching a tent. And people are being impacted by this. People that we don't even know. People that live right down the road. People that, uh, for some reason, have been led by the Spirit of God to support, to be a part of uh, what's going on here and what you guys, what this church is doing here. And I praise God for that. Then it goes on in verse 12 and says, Therefore I will divide him a portion with the great and shall, shall divide the spoil with the strong, because he has poured out his what? Life. Soul. His soul. It wasn't just a physical thing. His soul unto death. He was numbered with the transgressors, and he bare the sin of many, and made intercession for the transgressors. Now that word bear is an interesting word. It is nasaf. And it is the same word that is used all through the Bible, or as forgive. That's how it's translated in most Bible verses. Forgive. NASA. N-A-S-A. And you know, you've heard of NASA, right? You know, our space program, NASA. And of course, that word is, I think, connected because NASA, NASA, NASA means to lift up. You know, it's these space uh, craft lift up off the earth. They lift up into orbit. Well, the word NASA, which is translated forgive in many verses, blesses the man whose sins are forgiven, the Bible says, NASA. It means to bear or to lift up. See, sin isn't just a transgression where we sin, we do a, a negative action, and then we go to God and we say, please forgive me for this negative action. Sin comes with a consequence, and that consequence is guilt. Guilt is actually the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. That's the fruit that God never wanted us to taste of, never wanted us to experience. The tree of the knowledge of good and evil, the fruit of that tree is guilt. And when we tasted that tree, we tasted guilt. We took upon ourselves guilt. And guilt weighs you down. It's a burden on your shoulder. You feel guilty about everything and anything in our fallen world. And the way we pacify that guilt, the way we numb that guilt, the way we comfort ourselves in guilt is through drugs. That's why they call it Southern Comfort. Now, you may not understand what that is, but coming from the world, an alcoholic background because my whole family was alcoholic on both sides. Mom was Irish, I told you that. My grandmother was an alcoholic, had a Guinness every day, she had to, she had a wet brain. She had to have alcohol every day, a certain amount every day. I was raised in Alateen, my mom was in AA, my dad was a drinker also, a hard liquor, my aunt was a closet alcoholic. I was drinking alcohol when I was raised in I was drinking alcohol when I was six, seven years old, sipping alcohol. Kids go to pubs over there, it's not a big deal. And that's the way I was raised. So I just naturally tended in that direction. And I was having blackouts by the time I was 19 years of age. But for me, it was the way to deal with life. Life had been tough. Uh, we were basically abandoned when we were kids uh, after a certain age. My mom just lost it after the relationship with my dad. Second chance broke, you know, just fell apart. I was 11 at that time. And 12, 13, 14, 15, 16. By the time I was 16, I was on my own. But I was really on my own before that, taking care of myself in many ways. And so the way I dealt with that, not having a dad, not having a mom, you know, I turned to drugs. I turned to alcohol. That was a natural. And I went from there. 
and or work. I worked a lot. I worked hard. And then I got myself a car, a nice Camaro, 73 Camaro hot rod. And I had a GTO, 66 GTO before that. And then I got a motorcycle. I was going to buy myself a house. And, you know, I was just on the road to pacifying and numbing and trying to make myself feel good in drugs and work and material possessions. And we do it in education. We do it in all of the different things that are out there in the world help us to numb these feelings, these senses. And, and when we're alone, by ourselves, feeling rejected, feeling isolated, we turn to something to numb the pain. And a lot of times it's media. It's right there. It's right on our phone. We just turn to it. And I found myself, I found that when I tend to want to turn to that thing, whatever it is, because addiction isn't something that we just quit doing because, you know, I quit doing it because I quit doing it help. I'm an addict by nature. My fall of nature is, a, is an addict. It's, it's an addict's nature. It needs something. And so when I find myself wanting to turn to those things, I have to remind myself, this is just a symptom. There's a deeper cause. There's a relational cause here. I need relationship. I need connectivity. I need something in my heart, in my life, that is better than the thing I'm turning to. Because when I turn to the media and I... You know, I'm on YouTube watching stuff, you know, two or three hours, wasted time, I feel guilty. You know, or I stay up late at night and I didn't get a good night's rest, I feel guilty. You know, my wife, who's an early, I mean, she's just early to bed, she's like, so what were you doing last night? You know, well, I was watching YouTube videos, you know, it's Larry Bird and, you know, how, what a great basketball player he was, and I just got hooked on one little thing after another. I mean, YouTube has everything on it, everything. And I'm thinking in my brain, you know, that was a waste of time. I've got so much stuff I need to do, and I really need to get a good night's sleep. And what's the deal? Why am I inclined toward this? That's why I think it's really important for us to take a little fast for media, you know? Satan has made this so available that it's nearly impossible to get away from it, you know, because we need it to some degree. And so because we need it, then, of course, there it is. Hard to resist that temptation. I think it's good for us to set up maybe accountability. Have someone that we can check in with in these moments when we're feeling empty, when we're feeling like inclined to go in that direction. Someone that we can call, someone that can pray for us. And of course, pray for one another. We need to do this constantly. But that burden brings guilt, and we walk around with guilt. You know what guilt does? Guilt leads us to more sin. It's a vicious cycle. So when Adam felt the guilt, and God confronted him, and he felt guilty, what he did was he pointed the finger at him. Eve. Finger pointing is guilt. That's more sin. That's more, uh, you know, breaking of relationship. He starts pointing the finger at the wife. The wife saw what he did. And so she felt that guilt and she started pointing the finger at the serpent. And who were they really blaming? Who were they really pointing the finger at? Ultimately, God. God. And that's what we do. Sin and the committing of sin is really pointing the finger at God and saying, you know, you're not good enough. You're not powerful enough. You're not enough for me. I need something else. I need the sin that this world has to offer. But God tells us, and we see this in the experience of Mo Moses, Moses, it says, chose to suffer with the people of God rather than to experience the pleasure of sin for a season. That's what we're told in Hebrews chapter 11. What made him be willing to suffer with the people of God rather than be a pharaoh in Egypt and enjoy the pleasure of sin for a season? Well, there's a couple of things in the verse. We're told... That sin is pleasurable, but it's seasonal. Mm -hmm. Kind of like summer, you know? It only lasts for a few months, and then the winter comes. Well, that's the way sin is. Sin is pleasurable, but it's only for a short time. But in Psalm 16, verse 11, it says that at God's right hand, there are pleasures for how long? Forevermore. See, that's the problem with sin. It's seasonal. Pleasures of sin are seasonal. Excuse me, I shouldn't have said that's the problem with sin. That's the problem with the pleasure of sin. The pleasure of sin is seasonal, but God wants us to enjoy pleasure forever. God never wanted pleasure to end. And when we are on the other side of all this, pleasure will never end. There's no more pain. There's no more sorrow. None of it. It's all gone. And that's what God wants for us. So Moses, first of all, recognized that. In fact, in the context of Hebrews 11, it says he looked forward to his reward. He was looking ahead. He was thinking ahead. And one of the things that we don't do when we're faced with sin is we don't think, now what's the consequence of this? How am I going to feel about this tomorrow? 
But in spite of that, in spite of that weight of guilt that we feel, God comes along and he lifts it. That's Messiah. That's forgiveness. He lifts that weight of guilt. He doesn't just say you're forgiven. He actually lifts the weight of guilt. Now, sometimes we're satisfied with the idea that God forgives us. And that's not good enough. To be satisfied with the idea that God forgives us is like when I was a Catholic and I would go to confession. And I would go in there to this little box. The priest was on the other side and there was a little, you know, partition in the middle with a screened voice through and I would he would ask me what I've done that week and I tell him that you know I teased my sister and I you know didn't wasn't truthful with my mom and I you know and then he would you know ask me more and get all the sins out and then at the end he would tell me okay you're forgiven and I go say ten our fathers and three Hail Marys and you know put a little money in the box and that was it. But that wasn't there was no deep seated forgiveness there. There was no relief of the guilt. It was just this kind of quasi you're forgiven type of thing. I think many times that's the way we relate to God. We don't actually rest on the promises of forgiveness. We don't actually take in, for example, Micah chapter 7, where God repeats again and again and again that I'm going to forgive you, I'm going to do away with your sins, I'm going to put them into the depths of the sea, uh, they're going to be remembered no more. He just goes over it and over it and over it and over it. He wants us to somehow get into an understanding that we have actually been forgiven. So when and if we sin, we ask God for forgiveness, and then we have this time of probation that we put ourselves on. It's a mental thing, it's a spiritual thing, but we're not quite the same as we were before we committed that sin. Have you noticed that? We're like, I know God forgave me, I know I'm forgiven, but it takes some time for us to get back to maybe really feeling good about ourselves. And that is the weight of guilt. That's what Satan wants us to experience for prolonged periods of time. In fact, that's the way Jacob felt for a long time. He had already confessed his sin, repented his sin, but still, when he's wrestling with the angel, he's still wrestling with that guilt. He's still feeling that God isn't blessing him, that God is there to bless him, that he has to wrestle through his own feelings of unforgiveness. Jesus Christ has taken all of that. When we are forgiven, we are forgiven right now, we forgive it immediately, and we forgive it completely. But how long does it take for that to sink in? And I have to tell myself that. I have to say, you know, in spite of, regardless of, I am forgiven by God. And the reason why that is so important, you know, we think, well, surely if I wait a little longer and feel this remorse and feel this, you know, this guilt a little longer, surely that will be pleasing to God. No, it's not pleasing to God at all. Because sin is a detour in God's plan. And guilt adds to the detour, makes the detour longer. God wants us to get right back on track. A just man falls seven times and stays down on the ground? No. Rises up again. Get up. Get up. So God is telling us, he's encouraging us, get up. Get up. He wants us back up because he wants us on our feet as long as possible, as much as possible. Why? Because we have a work to do. The demoniacs had a work to do for Jesus. The disciples had a work to do for Jesus. And God has taken care of all of our sin, all of our guilt, and he wants us back on our feet and back to work. And that's the healthiest thing for us anyway. When we are working for the Lord, that is the place where we can gain the greatest spiritual health in our experience, the greatest spiritual strength in our experience. So Isaiah here is closing out with this idea that he is born, that is, he is forgiven, he is Messiah, the sins of the many, and that is all of humanity. And he's made intercession for transgressors. When did Christ do that? On the cross. Do you remember when Christ prayed in Luke chapter 23? He said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Is that Luke 23, Luke 22, 34? Who was he praying for? He was praying for the Romans. He was praying for... That was interesting. He was praying for the, oh, he was praying for the religious leaders. He was praying for the people who rejected him. He was interceding. And the Lord sang a song about how we pray for and intercede for. That's what we're called. We're called, we're called priests and, and intercessors. They call that. The yeah, it's moving. It's reaching, brother. Keep for when? And he interceded, and that's what God is calling us to do. He interceded on the cross. He interceded for the very people who were crucifying him. So... Christ, let's just summarize this, Isaiah 53, verse 2, 
Christ came in a form and appearance that was ordinary. He was not, he was comely, he was not magnificent, he didn't have great splendor, he didn't have beauty, he didn't line up with the messianic vision that God had for, uh, that the people had for him. Verse 3, he was despised because he wasn't the Messiah. He was rejected, he was destitute, he was filled with sorrow, anguish and affliction, grief, malady, anxiety, sickness, he was despised and disesteemed. Verse 4, he was again malady, anxiety, and every time that is repeated, that means it was a double emphasis. That there was more of that than the others. He was stricken. He was smitten. He was depressed. In verse 5, he was wounded. That means to, to break or dissolve. He was broken. He was dissolved. He was bruised. That means to crumble. Have you ever felt like your life is crumbling? Like your life is just broken? Like you're a broken person? Christ went through that. He was hit with stripes. That word means black blue marks. Now, verse 6, he bore the iniquity, that is the perversity, the moral evil of us all. Verse 7, he was oppressed. That means to harass and to tyrannize. He was afflicted. That means to depress. Verse 8, he was cut off. That means to divide, to exclude, and to destroy. He was stricken, that means to blow or spot like a leper. Verse 10, he was bruised, that means to crumble again. A repeat of verse 5, he was uh, put to grief, that means made sick and afflicted. Uh, he gave himself a guilt offering, the word offering means a guilt, fault, or sin offering for, for our sins. Verse 11, the travail, the, the worry, he was filled with worry. Verse 8, he bare, he carried... He had the burden of the sins of many. Verse 12, he poured out, that means he emptied, he was demolished. He poured out his soul unto death. He was numbered, he was allotted with the transgressors. He was officially enrolled, is what that means, with the transgressors. And he bare, he nasah, he lifted up the sins of many. So when you read through these verses, the, there's no wonder that his, this report wasn't received. Because this report is talking about more than the physical, we're talking about the emotional anguish that Messiah will experience. And that emotional anguish is connected directly with the way that Messiah came. It became completely different than the way that the Jews and the religious leaders expected it to come. Now, translate that to us. Because many times when we come into the Adventist church, we, we think we're coming into this glorious thing that is better than everyone else, that is something that is going to set us apart as, you know, and we do. At times, you know, the media talks about the Adventists and their health message and how they live longer and, you know, you have these different, but we, at times, we, we paint a picture of what Adventism is supposed to be in such a way that we're reluctant to be viewed differently by the world. What I mean by that is even, even evangelicals, we're willing to compromise. We compromise the truth of God because we don't want to look so peculiar, so different, so unlike everyone else, because we're afraid of experiencing everything that Christ experienced in Isaiah 53. We're afraid of stepping inside that, that mind and that heart of the Lord, which is, you know, which is to Jesus. Let us find a new which is also to Jesus. Just like it. Just like it. Because this is. We see this experience not only the death of Christ, but we see it as something that God is calling us to enter into personally and individually. So that when the end of time comes and we are the offscouring of the world, we hate it for Christ's name's sake. Maybe it's because of the Sunday law issue, you know, maybe it's because of the way we relate to religious liberty and freedom and the way that you know some of these you know control things are coming down. We were saying, no, we don't agree with that. We believe freedom is the most important thing. We're not afraid of that. We're not afraid to step out. We're not afraid to be ridiculed. We're not afraid to be canceled. We're not afraid because that's what our Lord went through. He stood out from all of the religious society and all of the normal society, but he was attracted to, and he was attracted to those who were the offscouring of the world, the publicans, the singers, the people that were, um, you know, on the side, people that were not, you know, in society, accepted, embraced, he, those people were attracted to Christ. And 
God has those people for us. There, those people are right here on the campgrounds. Those people are all around us. And God wants us to reach out to them. And have you ever, have you ever felt yourself feeling uncomfortable around someone who doesn't fit into society the way all of us do? Maybe they don't dress the way we do, or maybe they don't look the way we do, or maybe they don't smell the way we do, or maybe they're not living the way we do, and you don't quite feel comfortable just going up to them. But, you know, I have so many people that come to me and say, oh, I've seen you on TV, and you're as big or a head, nice to meet you, and da 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 And, you know, there's someone sitting right over there that's exactly the opposite, a no-name, nobody, you wouldn't even, and they don't even look that way. Have you ever experienced that? Because I experience it all the time. I feel like we're missing the mark. I feel like when people come onto this campus, when people come into our churches, when people come into our lives that are way over there, we need to be embracing them. We need to be running them. We need to be figuring out how can we minister to these people. That's what Christ did. He went out of his way to minister to the Samaritan woman at the well. And I don't feel that we have the natural inclination to do that. And maybe it's because of our insecurities. If we can just get this right, if we can just figure this out. Now, I don't want to leave you with that thought because that thought can be uh, underwhelming or overwhelming. Second Corinthians chapter 5. Let's just look at one verse here as we close out this section and move into um, the Holy Spirit. So we're going to give ourselves at least 20 minutes to do that. Second Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 21. And I wish we could look at the whole chapter, but this verse is so beautiful and so powerful. Second Corinthians 5 verse 21, it says... Jesus Christ, or he, God, has made him, Jesus Christ, to be sin for us, who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. Now, this verse is pure gospel, because it's telling us why it is that we're righteous. The reason why we're righteous is not because we've accepted Christ as our Savior. The reason why we're righteous is not because we're Seventh-day Adventists. The reason why we're righteous is not because we keep the Seventh-day Sabbath. The reason why we're righteous is not because of all the things that we do. The re reason why we're righteous is because Jesus Christ made sin for us. He knew no sin. I want you to just think about that for a second. Jesus Christ knew no sin whatsoever. He was holy. He was made sin for us. That means he didn't deserve to be made sin because he never sinned. But he was made sin for us. And in the same way, we are made righteous. We're made the righteousness of God in him. Do we deserve to be the righteousness of God? No. Not any more than Jesus deserved to be made sin. He didn't do anything to deserve to be made sin, and we don't do anything to deserve the righteousness of God. That's why the Bible tells us it's a gift. And we're still going around, dragging our feet, thinking, well, there's something that I probably need to do to earn this thing or to pay God back. You remember the man who was forgiven a great debt? And he went out to his fellow servant and grabbed him by the throat and said, pay me everything that I owe. I can do that when he's forgiven his great debt. Because when he went into the king, he went in on his terms. His terms were, give me time and I'll pay you all. And when he said that, the king had compassion. That's what the word of God says. The king had compassion on him, and he forgave him the whole debt right then and there. But the servant had gone in on his terms, and he went out on his terms. And I think sometimes we come to God on our terms, and we go out and we interact with our fellow human beings on our terms. God has forgiven us the whole debt. The whole thing's forgiven. We don't need to be urging to be pulling out of other people compliance. We don't need to be getting any kind of small minor debt out of them in order to somehow recompense or pay back the debt that God has forgiven us. Our debt is forgiven. And as soon as we realize that, it's going to change the way we relate to other people. That's what the story is telling us. Jesus is trying to communicate to us that when we realize we've been fully forgiven, we're not going to grab other people by the throat anymore. When they owe us something, and everyone owes us something, the guy that pulled in front of you down the road owes you something, right? I mean, how, how could he do that, right? Or she. And everyone owes us something, but when we realize how much God has forgiven us, how much we owe him and he forgave us, we're not going to be holding what other people owe us against them. We're not going to be treating them in that negative way anymore. And this is what we want to close on as we 
moved it, well, last meeting tomorrow, but we're moving this meeting on the ultimate um, sacrifice of the Holy Spirit. Let's just move into that right now because it's so important for us to understand the Spirit's sacrifice. You know, there's a lot of people today who are questioning the inclusion of the Holy Spirit in the Godhead. And they're basically saying the Spirit is an essence. The Spirit is not really God. The Spirit, the Spirit is not really a person. It's an essence. Now, this was uh, prominent even in our in our pioneers. I mean, many of our pioneers believe this. They believe it's God the Father, the Spirit is an essence, and Jesus was begotten. So many years ago, E.J. Wagner says that in uh, Christ All Righteousness. But so many years ago, we didn't have to worry about that. But they were weak. They were semi Arian. They were weak on the Godhead, the Trinity, because Catholicism had kind of perverted that, so we didn't want to be, you know, closely associated. In time, of course, this transformation came about where we started really understanding the Godhead, the Trinity, in the biblical sense. But it's difficult for us because, you know, there's not a lot in the Bible about the Holy Spirit. I mean, we see clear evidence in the Bible that, you know, God the Father is a person. We see clear evidence in the Bible that Jesus Christ is a person, but the evidence for the Holy Spirit is not as clear to us. And I believe that there's a reason for that. And I think one of the main reasons for that is because the Holy Spirit didn't come and manifest himself to reveal him. He came to manifest and reveal Jesus. The Holy Spirit, in my understanding, is the ultimate revelation of other-centered love. The Holy Spirit, in my understanding, is the ultimate revelation of God's focus on somebody else. God, the Holy Spirit is here to talk about the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is here to talk about Jesus. The Holy Spirit is the most selfless manifestation. Well, I can't say it's the most selfless because God the Father, God the Holy Spirit, so in way. But here we have another selfless manifestation, right? So when we're praying for the outpouring of the Holy Spirit so that we can be more powerful, a more powerful manifestation of ourselves, we're not going to receive the Holy Spirit because the Holy Spirit didn't to glorify a human being. The Holy Spirit came to glorify Christ. The Holy Spirit is almost unseen. You know when the wind blows, there's the, the, the Holy Spirit is there. The Holy Spirit is almost unknown. And when we're filled with the Holy Spirit, we're going to be unseen. The more known we are and the more seen we are, the more evidence we have that the Holy Spirit is there. we are and the more seen we are as individuals. The more we want us to be in the limelight, the more evidence we have that the Holy Spirit is not there. So, how is it that we're to be unknown and unseen? Well, let's just open our Bibles to Ephesians chapter 4. And we'll start at verse 17 because of time. I'm not going to keep you here until 5 o'clock, even though I'm tempted to. I'm going to resist that temptation by the grace of God. Amen. Because you know what it means when a pastor says he's about to quit. He's about to finish his sermon. Absolutely nothing. <laughs> Ephesians chapter 4, beginning with verse 17. This I say, therefore, and testify in the Lord, that ye henceforth walk not as other Gentiles walk, in the vanity of the mind, having the understanding darkened, being alienated from the life of God, through the ignorance of that is in them, because of the blindness of their heart, who being past feelings have given themselves over to the civishness, to work all uncleanness with greediness. But ye have not so learned Christ. If so be that you have heard of him, and have been taught by him as the truth is in Jesus, that you put off concerning the former conversation, the old man, which is corrupt according to deceitful lust, and be renewed in the spirit of your mind that you put on the new man. That you put on the new man which after God is creating righteousness and true holiness. Wherefore, putting away lying, you ever lie? The Holy Spirit is there. Lying. Speak every man the truth with his neighbor. For we are members one of another. Be angry and sin not. Let not the sun go down upon your wrath. Now that's an interesting verse. Not long ago I was going through a pretty intense experience and I was talking to a, a dear sister that I've known for many, many years and she said to me, 
Are you angry? We're on the phone. Are you angry? And there was a long pause. Because I'm a pastor. Pastors don't get angry. Never mind. Are you angry? It's angry. And she said, you think it's, an, you think it's a sin to be angry, don't you? I'm just looking at my mind, yeah. And she said, James, it's not a sin to be angry. She said, you know, the Bible talks about anger. And most of the references refer to God. That God is angry. Over and over again. If you, were, if you haven't studied this, study it. Over and over again, the Bible talks about how angry God is. It's not wrong to be angry. The reason why God is angry, the reason why Job was angry, and the reason why God said, that's my man, that's my perfect man there, is because sin is wrong. And it makes us angry. When people are mistreated, when you're mistreated, when anyone, so when, when sin manifests its ugly head, when the Holy Spirit is working in our hearts, sin makes us angry. So it says here, be angry. You can know that the Holy Spirit is working on your heart when you're angry. But notice what it says, be angry and sin not. So obviously anger and sin are opposites. And obviously God wants us to be angry and not sin. So it's not, being angry is not sinful, it's how we're angry. It's how we manifest that anger that can be sinful or not. And God wants us, I'll just give you a quick story on this. I think it's, it's a biblical story and it's really powerful. It kind of illustrates this. David, a man after God's own heart, right? He's a young shepherd. He comes into Israel. He takes out Goliath. And he starts, you know, Saul wants him in the palace. And he starts fighting the Philistines. And one day after they come back from battle, the women are all just praising the Lord. And they're saying, uh, Saul has slain his thousands and David his. Ten thousands. And Saul just lost it. As soon as we're in the spotlight, the Holy Spirit's gone. And the Holy Spirit was gone from Saul because he was, he was sent. He started out humble, but he was sent. You know, that's, that's something that can happen to us in our lives. You know, when I, I talked to Danny Shelton, you know, a few weeks ago, and he said, you know, create again makes monsters. Media, Christian media makes monsters. That's what Christian media does. Because as soon as humble people who love the Lord and study His Word get in front of the camera and they get up there and people start, you know, whistling a little bit pretty soon it's the biggest temptation to become a monster. It's become a fallen, sinful human being because we're, we can't take that. We can't take that. Human beings can't take that. We're not made for that. All the glory needs to go to God, not to a human being. Amen. And Jesus knew this. As a human, He knew this. And so when when he performed his greatest miracles, he was God. Like, he wasn't even around. He was God. He was in prayer. He was with the Father because he knew what the humanity was like. He knew how it was impacted. So Danny said to me, you know, three of you have mixed monsters. And, you know, you've been working with us for a number of years, and we believe that, you know, we'll remain humble. So you've got to pray for me and for everyone else that's ever on TV because we use that as a, as a way of reaching the world, but it can destroy us. And you can see person after person after person. In Christianity and in the world, we've been destroyed by this, you know, by the media. So David is dealing with a monster now. The spirit of God has gone from Saul, and Saul's trying to kill him. And one day, Saul throws a spear at him. And, you know, the spirit of prophecy says it was an angel that pushed that spear away that saved David's life. An angel saved him. And he took off to his house. He was married, married to, son, to, to Saul's daughter. And he went off to his house. And he was in the house hiding, and Saul sent men to the house to watch the house. And Michael came up with an idea. She made a dummy, you know, put sheepskin on it or whatever, and put it in the bed. And David, at nighttime, David slipped out the window and he took off. And, of course, eventually Saul said, I want you to bring the whole bed, you know, because Michael said he's sick in bed and, and found out, you know, and was re Saul was ready to kill his daughter. And she said, no, no, David made me do this. He made me do this. He told me he was going to kill me if I didn't do this. You know, so she told a little uh, lie there. And... David was off in the wilderness, and people started joining him out there. And at one point in his experience, he was inside a cave with his men, and Saul came into the cave. And Saul's men said to him, now I just want to share this story with you from the perspective of a brand new Christian, because, uh, you know, 1984, I accepted Christ as my Savior, and I'd never read the Bible before, and I was reading through the Bible, and I was reading this story for the first time ever. And I didn't know the end of it. I didn't know what happened. 
know how it is. My first one's like, what the hell? So I'm reading the story, and you get to the place you know, where Saul's trying to kill David, and he's in this cave hiding, and Saul happens to get in there with, his, with a couple of his men. But all of David's men are in the cave, or on the outside around the cave. And one of the men whispers to David and says, this is an answer to prayer. This is an answer to prayer. God has delivered your enemy into your hands. Just say the word, and we will kill him. We'll just take care of him. Isn't this, what a blessing. And I remember when I was reading the Bible the first time in my life, I'm like, yes, God is so good. You know, David was a good man, and, and God is protecting him, and now God is giving him an opportunity to take out his enemy. You know, I've never read the Bible before, and I'm just like, yeah, this is good, and his men are encouraging him, let's take him out, you know. This is perfect. This is how God works. And then I continue to read the story. You know how the story goes, right? <laughs> David said, God forbid that I should put forth my hand against the Lord, against the anointed. And he stays his name, stops his name from taking Saul. That's how living is good. Saul goes out, and even then he feels guilty. And when this, Saul's at a safe distance away, he lifts up his skirt and says, Saul, look, I could have killed you, but I didn't. And of course, Saul confesses his sin, and the Spirit of God convicts him, and he confesses his sin, and he says to David, You're more righteous than me, and you're going to be king in Israel. Now, the question I have is, how did David end up, what caused him to be able to do that? How was he able to withhold from taking revenge? I almost justifiable revenge on Saul. Well, I believe it's because he processed his anger. If you read Psalm 59, it's a really interesting psalm because this psalm actually tells us that this was written when David was hiding from God, excuse me, from Saul, in, uh, in his house, and men watch the house together. And that's what the, the, the psalm says when you when you look at the heading of the title. At least in my Bible, I've got this wide margin King James Bible to the chief musician um, of David, when Saul sent and watched the house to kill him. And if you go through this psalm, Psalm 59, it's what I use the acronym HELPS, H-E-L-P-S. This is how to deal with anger 101. And the reason why many times we are angry toward individuals and toward people is because we don't process anger the way that God tells us to in Ephesians 4.26. Be angry and sin not. Don't let the sun go down in your wrath. That's step-by-step -step instruction. So before the sun goes down, get to a private place, whether it's by your bedside or in your closet, wherever it is, get your, and review your day. And think about whatever it was that, that may have pushed your buttons that day. Maybe it was your wife, maybe it was your husband, maybe it was your kids, maybe it was your neighbor's dog, maybe it was that bird that let loose of your car right after you washed and waxed it. Who knows what it was, okay? Think about your day and process. The first thing that David does is he asks God to help him. Verse 1, deliver me from my enemies, oh my God, defend me from them that rise up against me. That's the first thing he does, deliver me. So he asks God for help, that's H. The next thing he does is in verses 3 and 4. He explains, that's the E, he explains his situation. You know, they're watching me, they want to kill me. It's not without cause. They, I haven't done anything wrong, but they're trying to kill me. He explains the situation. That's the E. And then the L stands for he lets it out. He lets all of his anger, all of his feelings, all of his frustrations out. Notice, for example, verse 13. Consume them in thy wrath. Consume them. They may not be. Let them be the cowboys of Jacob out of the ends of the earth. See them. Sabbath school to the children this week. My boys won't make it. They're going to have sore behinds, you know, whatever it is, right? We put up the shiny side, but the truth of the matter is, is that David was wrong with God. Job was wrong with God. We need to be wrong with God. 
law of God. Because if we walk with God, we walk with God. The truth. See, if we will process this, so David processes this, this anger with God. He gets it all out. And by the time you get to the end of Psalm 59, David is praising the Lord. But I will sing, verse uh, 16, I will sing of thy power. Yea, I will sing a lot of thy mercy in the morning, for thou hast been my defense, and a refuge in the day of my trouble. Unto thee, O my strength, I will sing, for God is my defense, the God of my mercy. Saul's trying to kill him, and he's singing. He's praising God. Why? Because he's processing. He's given it all to God. He's told God how he feels about Saul, how he feels about his men, how he wants them to die. He just wants them to be consumed. He wants God to take care of all of this. And by the time he gets into that cave, he's done. Sometimes we do that a little bit, but we do it with the wrong people. We have a bad experience with Brother A, and we go to talk to Sister C. And we tell Sister C all about how bad Brother A is. And then we feel bad. <laughs> and that's gossip. That's what happens. We gossip. And gossip, actually, the reason why it's so contagious and the reason why we do it so much is because it kind of helps get the pressure out. It's a, it's a relief to some degree. But it's not a functional relief. It's not a healthy relief. Mm. It's a dysfunctional relief. Mm. Because while it relieves some of the pressure, it contaminates this brother over here or the sister over here. Mm -hmm. And it still hasn't dealt with the problem over here. And that problem is still is still there. And as soon as we get in contact with this over here, the button's going to be pushed again, and all it's going to all come out again. That's why relationships get worse and worse and worse, mm -hmm. and not better and better and better. Mm -hmm. We've got to learn to process. And the only way that we can process our anger is with God. Job did that. You know, Job was all shiny in the first couple of chapters. You know, the Lord's laid, the Lord's good. The Lord gives, God takes away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. You know, and I, it's fine. Don't, honey, honey, calm down. Don't be foolish. Don't speak like that. And then by the time you get to chapter 9 of Job, he's like, you know, I'd love to take God to court, but I don't think he'd show up. <laughs> I don't know why he's doing this to me, but you know, he's probably not going to give me an answer. I mean, the guy, he is literally out, out, outside himself. He's lost it. And that's us. But we're not willing to face it because we want to be rid of the sins. We want to look rich and good for goods and need of nothing. And we're not willing to be real with ourselves and with God. And God wants us to be real so that we don't sin. Because if we're not real, we're going to sin. We're going to hurt people. We're going to hurt ourselves. And so God is saying, I need you to learn how to process this. How to be angry and sin not. Let's continue on in Ephesians chapter 4. So it goes on to say here, Neither give place to the devil. And that's what we're doing. We're not processing, processing this. We're giving place to the devil. Let him that stole steal no more. But rather let him labor, working with his hands, the thing which is good, that he may have to give to him that needeth. Let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth. Why do we have corrupt communication? Because we gossip and process how we feel about the good for us. But that which is good to be edifying, that it may move. Excuse me, minister grace unto the hearers. And grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, whereby ye are sealed unto the day of redemption. And that's where we've been trying to get to in this meeting. What is the sacrifice of the Holy Spirit? The sacrifice of the Holy Spirit is to have the third person of the Godhead pursuing us, knocking on our door, convicting us, teaching us, leading us into truth. And for us to be acting the way we just read in Ephesians chapter 4. When we, we, when we act this way, we fail to process our anger healthily. When we act this way, we grieve the Spirit of God. Have you ever been grieved? Have you ever had someone hurt you? Shun you? You know, the Holy, have you ever had someone who doesn't listen to you? You know, it's really interesting. We went on a little journey yesterday to crack in the road. No, crack in the rock. Crack in the rock. Crack in the world. Ground. Crack in the ground. Can't find it, can't, can't name it. All right? And we got lost once. And we got lost twice. And we were all talking about who's going to use this as a sermon illustration. Is James going to use it? Is Steve going to use it? Who's going to, someone's going to use this. So I thought, well, Steve gave it an effort. I'll give it an effort, too. The entire time we're trying to find this place. We're following one GPS, then we're following another GPS. There's a third GPS that's saying, telling us the way to go. But we're not listening to that GPS. 
we listen to this one, and then we listen to somebody else. And so we go, you know, five miles down this dirt road, and we go 11 miles down that road, and finally we say, well, let's follow that other GPS, right? And the other GPS takes us back to where we actually needed to be to find this location. But why weren't we listening to it in the first place? Why? See, I believe the Holy Spirit is like our GPS. Now, the reason why I didn't want to listen to that GPS in the first place is because it is my GPS. And sometimes my GPS is wrong. You, I mean, have you ever followed a GPS and it takes you, like, you're thinking, where am I? <laughs> what in the world? So we have a little bit of doubt about whether that voice is going to take us in the right direction. And a lot of times when we interact with each other, we don't listen to one another. Children don't listen to parents, right? We don't always listen to the pastor because there's a little bit of doubt, right? We're not 100% convinced. Credibility isn't there necessarily. And so we're thinking that maybe we need to try another path. But the Holy Spirit is God. All seeing, all knowing, omnipresent, omniscient, right? Mm -hmm. Never fail. The inspire of the Holy Scriptures, 100% accurate all of the time. Never fail. And the Holy Spirit is speaking to us. Unlike our GPSs, unlike any human voice, unlike the pastor, unlike parents. The Holy Spirit is speaking to us. You know, the seven churches. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Over and over again, all the way down through history, the Holy Spirit is speaking to us. And we don't listen it's like not to listen to. You know what it's like not to listen to when you know you're 100 percent Oh, but honey, but dear, but sweetheart, but friends, but family, but son, but daughter, but mom, dad. Listen to me. I know what I'm talking about. You don't know what you're talking about. Follow me. Trust me. I got this. I got this figured out. The Holy Spirit is 100% accurate, never made a mistake, speaking to us, convicting us, this is the way, walk you in it, and we don't listen. You know what that feels like? That is the sacrifice of the Spirit, to be grieved again and again and again. And you know, the ultimate sacrifice of the Spirit is when we commit the unpardonable sin. And that's not the Holy Spirit saying, I am sick and tired of you not listening to me, I'm done with you. That never happens. That never happens. That's when we say, I don't hear it. I'm not listening to that ever again. Our conscience is seared as with a hot iron. And we can no longer listen to it. We no longer want to listen to it. There's nothing that can convince us to listen to the Holy Spirit. You know how the Holy Spirit feels then? You know how frustrating it is to know to have the answer to something that is really important and want to share it with someone I mean, really important to have them not listen, not accept, not be willing to accept that. This is the sacrifice of the Holy Spirit. This is what is happening with the Holy Spirit. For example, when we sin, the Holy Spirit wants to comfort us. In John chapter 14, the Holy Spirit is called, 16, the Holy Spirit is called uh, comforter. Well, I don't want to be comforted. I need to bear this. I need to, don't, don't but God wants to comfort us right now. God wants to bring us comfort. God wants to bring us forgiveness. God wants to bring us relief right now. We don't have to be on probation. We don't have to wait a while. The Holy Spirit is there to comfort us. The Holy Spirit is there to instruct us. The Holy Spirit is there to intercede. In, in Romans chapter 8 it says, He intercedes. We don't even know how to pray. The Holy Spirit intercedes with our weaknesses and prays wars that we don't know how to pray. That's why every prayer is a good prayer when it's a sincere prayer. Holy Spirit interprets that prayer. So, in the context of Ephesians chapter 4, let's just continue on with this. In the context of Ephesians chapter 4, read not the Holy Spirit of God, whereby you were sealed unto the day of, of, of redemption. The Holy Spirit is the sealing of God. God seals us with His Holy Spirit. And some people say, some have to say, well, I thought the Sabbath was the seal of God, not the Holy Spirit. You know, when I do evangelism, Christians will come to me on the seal of God night, and they'll say, well, you know, we believe that the Holy Spirit is the seal of God, not the Sabbath. The Sabbath is the old covenant. The Holy Spirit is the seal of God. And that's an argument that is 
coming in because it says right here that we're sealed with the Holy Spirit. It says in Ephesians chapter 2 also, you know, that we're sealed, the earnest of the Holy Spirit, the earnest of the seal of the Holy Spirit. So my response to that is really simple. The Holy Spirit is God. And God is revealed through his taking out the law. The law of God is not separate from God himself, right? It's a revelation of who he is. God's law is God. It's his character. It's a revelation of who he is. God is love. And so if we're sealed with the Sabbath, guess what? That's the seeing of the Holy Spirit. Because the Holy Spirit is one with the Sabbath. Because the Holy Spirit is God. There's no dichotomy. There's no difference. There's no we're sealed with the Holy Spirit or we're sealed with the Sabbath. The reason why we think that way is because we think the Sabbath is some kind of day that is separate from God himself. It's not. The Sabbath is all about our relationship with God. It's about connecting with God. And you know, we need a command in our fallen state to tell us to connect with God. Because as the Sabbath comes in, you know how it is. You've got one more thing you've got to do. You've got one more call you've got to make. You've got one more bill you've got to pay. You've got one more trip to the store you've got to do. I mean, we need a command in our fallen state. And then once we get into the Sabbath, we find ourselves, you know, I this happens to me over and over again, because I think I'm I'm I lean toward workaholism. I would never, um, I would never, you know, especially in a public meeting, I would never confess that I'm a workaholic. It would not be a good thing to do. But I might have tendencies in that direction. <laughs> and so when the Sabbath comes, I'm like, oh, I gotta stop. You know how that is, guys? You gotta stop. You're right into something, you gotta stop. That's oh, that's hard to do. But I find when I stop and I let go, and on those good weeks, I prepare ahead of time and stop and let go with plenty of time. I find entering into the Sabbath, it completely changes. Like even coming to this camp meeting, it's like, oh man, there's so many things here at work. It's gotta go to the camp meeting, gotta go to the camp meeting. Okay, let's go, you know. And I get out here, I'm like, not even connected with all the stuff that I was doing before. I just don't even feel connected with that anymore. It's like I, I'm going to have to start all over again and get re-motivated to get back into that. You know what I'm saying? That's how the Sabbath is. We enter into this thing, and it's like, whoa. We just, God just wants us to just experience letting go of the world every single week. Because as we experience that week after week, and by the way, this is the danger of not experiencing it. It's experiencing it. As we experience it, I'm sorry, I'm out of time. I'm trying to talk too fast, so I'll try to slow down. As we experience letting go of the world every week, we prepare to ultimately let go of the world in the end of time. In the end time, we're going to have to let go of the world. And so God is saying, you know, in order for you to do that, I'm going to have to encourage you to do it on a regular basis right now. Develop that letting go experience week by week. And when the end comes, it's going to be easier. It's not going to be totally easy, but it's going to be easier. It's like, you know, it's like exercise. The more you do it, the stronger you get. And that's why some of us are going to have a harder time letting go than others. Because some of us have been reluctant to let go, to keep that Sabbath. We're still doing our own thing on the Sabbath. I don't want to say a lot about that, but I wish you could understand the Sabbath is more than just a day. It is a relationship with God. A relationship that God wants us to have and others to have. So don't be the Spirit of God whereby you're sealed on the day of redemption. Here it goes. Here it is. Here's the closing verses. Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and evil speaking be put away from you with all malice and be kind one to another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, even as God for Christ's sake has forgiven you. You can know that the Holy Spirit is filling you when you see these characteristics. You can know that the Holy Spirit is being grieved when you see the fruit of this one. It's very practical. And God is longing for us to experience the forgiveness of Christ so that we can listen to what the churches say, what the Spirit says to the churches, so we can receive the comfort, receive the direction, receive the teaching, receive the conviction of the Holy Spirit, so we can be anointed with the Holy Spirit. So we don't have we don't have any need of a man teaching us. I mean, we don't really need me to stand up here, or Steve to stand up here, or Pastor uh, Charles to stand up here and teach you. All we're doing is facilitating. That's all we're doing. We're facilitating a meeting between us and God. Whenever we, the speaker, become the focus of that, we've lost.
also varies. But if we can facilitate, kind of like a Sabbath school. You know, the Sabbath school teaches, um, we were talking today about, you know, the Sabbath school was, before the panel came up, the Sabbath school was becoming the second sermon. No, the Sabbath school is supposed to be someone leading out and facilitating a group study in the Word of God. You all are to be anointed with the Holy Spirit. That's what 1 John chapter 2, verses yep. 20 and 27 says. You don't need anyone to teach you because you have an unction from the Holy Spirit. And that unction teaches you all things and you're all things. So when I get up here to preach, you, your unction, you've been studying the Word of God yourself. The Holy Spirit has anointed you. And you're reading along with me and you're finally going, yeah. And, and maybe there's something you haven't heard before. Something I listened to Steve. Steve came and gave, me, gave us a special reading this morning. Special, I mean, you'll get it tonight, but we've got it already. And I was like, yeah, I, yeah, it makes sense to me. Because the Holy Spirit that's teaching him is the Holy Spirit teaching me. Now, you may be listening to a pastor and you're like, uh-uh. You know? And some people are like, whatever the pastor says, that's what they believe. Because there no, there's no unction with the Holy Spirit in their individual lives. So pastors and teachers are here to facilitate what God is instructing you or what God wants to instruct you. So they just open the Word of God and the Holy Spirit that's, that's inspired this Word now goes out into this congregation and is among us, convicting us that this is true. What is being said is true. Jesus did this all the time. He opened the Word of God. He, he said, it is written. It is written again. And the people got it and they went to the Word. He says, I don't say anything about what my Father says. And that's, it's really good for, for preachers. It's really good to have that relationship. Because if they call Jesus Beelzebub, they're going to call us Beelzebub. But it doesn't matter. See, when you lift up pastors and teachers, you put them in a precarious position because now they want to maintain that position. And they'll start preaching and teaching things that will cause people. So that really clarifies, or yeah, that's something I'm going to have to pray about. That's what this whole thing is all about. We've turned it upside down. The evangelical started it, and we continued it. We turned it upside down. Media has helped us to do that. You know, and media can be really beneficial. I love it when you get on there with panel discussions, you get on there with groups. You get on there with one person in the ministry they're doing, is that they it's called by their name. You've got all this focus on the person, and people leave there and they say, I like this person, I like this person, I like this person. Paul had that problem in Corinth. You know, some were saying, I follow Paul. Some were saying, I follow Cephas. Some were saying, I follow Paul. Paul says, you're all carnal with that mentality. You're all carnal. Now, you may have speakers that you uh, relate to more than others, but the bottom line is the word of God. Amen. So you don't diss a speaker because he doesn't speak the way you like him to speak. He doesn't tell as much many jokes as the other person. He doesn't dress quite the way that you want. You would question him if he was teaching something that was out of harmony. That's it. That's it. Other than that, we support. We encourage one another. We encourage the various speakers because God is working through all of the of the various speakers and teachers to bring people into the light of truth and to help them have an experience of the Word of God. So we don't read the Holy Spirit of God. We don't speak negative, gossipy, bitter, malice words. We edify, we lift up, we open our hearts to the Spirit, and the Spirit through us speaks word of truth, conviction, comfort. All of those characteristics that the Holy Spirit has come to do are to be in us as we're filled with the Holy Spirit. And when, when someone directs attention to us, we reflect that attention to Jesus. The Holy Spirit came to lift up Jesus. He came to talk about Jesus. So as soon as someone starts talking about you, you say, well, Jesus, the Lord. You know, Daniel did that. Remember when Ariok came into uh, Nebuchadnezzar's presence and said, I found the man. I found the man that can give you the interpretation. I was like, really, Eric? What did you do? <laughs> you know, did you do a search on the web? Like, how did you find Daniel? Like, you really must. Everyone wants a little bit of credit, right? And so Nebuchadnezzar listens to Eric, and Nebuchadnezzar looks at Daniel and says, 
is this true? Is this true, Daniel? Can you, can you interpret the truth? Are you the man? You know what Daniel says? First he says, there's no one among your wise men who had this dream. That's the first thing he says. He completely decimates every kingdom in the common land. All the wise men, none of them can do it. And then you know what he says? There's a God in heaven. He completely bypasses himself. Ariel pointed to Daniel, and Daniel says, no, nope, there's a God in heaven. And he's the God. And that's where we need to be. That's where we're going to be. And you know, over and over again in the book of Daniel, I told you what it, what it means when people say there's a God in heaven, right? Over and over again in the book of Daniel, you know what it says about Daniel? An excellent spirit was in him. An excellent spirit was in him. That was the spirit of God. The spirit of God. Daniel was a humble man, and he maintained that humility all the way through to the very end. He continued to hold on to Jesus Christ. So much so when that Galatians man confronted with a vision of Jesus in Daniel chapter 10, he said, he fell on his face and said, he said, there's no goodness in me. My goodness was turning me into corruption. That's going to be our experience. We're going to realize there's nothing in us. All of our motives of selfish. Everything we do is motivated by self. Yes, and God has to cleanse all of that. And he continues to cleanse all of that. And because of that, God, we can say, Lord, it's not me. It's not me. It's not me. So whenever he uses, it's always going to be. to listen to over and over again. And the feelings and the experience that the Holy Spirit goes through. He just wants to help us to get out of ourselves and point us to Jesus. To get out of our malice and our gossip and our bitterness. And to free us from that anger that causes us to sin so that we can process the world. Father, we've all been mistreated. We walk this planet being mistreated all the time. We know it, we feel it, and it affects us. It lays upon us a burden that only you can lift. And you lifted it. Isaiah 53 says, you nasa, you forgave, you lifted that burden, the burden off every one of us. And so we come to you right now, and we yoke up with you, because we know your burden is easy. Your yoke is light. We yoke up with you, Father, and we ask that we can enter into that rest. Walking with you, talking with you, trusting in you. Do this for us, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. amen.